Okay, today we have a small subject by which we will finish chapter four before we start a new chapter. That was the effect of wind on conductor of transmission line. If you remember, we postponed in this last time because I told you I want to show you some videos that will make the idea clear. In fact, wind effect is taken into consideration on all engineering structures, whether static structures or dynamic structures. And for the simple light pole near your house, underneath, deep in the ground, there is a foundation which is designed and constructed to withstand wind speed up to 160 km per hour. For transmission lines, they are, they are subjected to such wind forces, and if the normal component of the wind on the conductor of transmission line is so high, conductor will break, or maybe even the tower completely will collapse down. This is one example which shows you the effect of the wind on the conductor of transmission line. You can see that the pole is collapsing. For such area which are exposed to wind storm and cyclones, these forces are always existing. In fact, this is not our subject. Our subject is some things which we call cyclic or periodic oscillation happening on the conductor of the transmission line. We have three common oscillations, Aeolian vibration, galloping, and weight-induced oscillation. You see, it's cyclic, it's periodic. There is vibration, there is oscillation. All of these things are related to waves. So in order to understand these parameters, the difference between them, we have to review the basic concept of wave. The characteristic of wave is an amplitude, the height of the wave above the reference level, the frequency, how many cycles are repeated per second. Sometimes you will Here, the wavelength. Wavelength is opposite to frequency. When we know the frequency, we know we will have will be having an idea about the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. They are oppositely related to each other. So basically, we have an amplitude, the height of the wave above the reference level, in addition to the frequency. Based on this, waves can be with different combinations. And for low amplitude wave, it can have low frequency or high frequency. Also the high amplitude wave can have both low frequency and high frequency. We have these four possible combinations for the wave, frequency and amplitude. Let's bear this in mind when we are discussing this cyclic motion of the transition line conductors. Now, first thing is Ionian. Ionian is a Greek word related to wind, blown by the wind. As you can see, Aeolian vibration has the highest frequency among these. It can reach 150 hertz, and from 3 hertz up to 150 hertz. But the amplitude is very less. It's in the range of millimeter and centimeters. This is Aeolian vibration, the highest frequency, and the amplitude is very little in the order of millimeter and centimeter. Galloping has a high amplitude wave, measured in meters, but the frequency is very less, around 3 hertz. But this galloping is the most severe one. It will, we'll see the video, we we'll see everything related to the physics of this. Amplitude can be measured in the range of meters. Then we have wake induced, this around 10 hertz, the frequency. The amplitude is in the range of centimeters. Before we explain the physics of these, before we see the videos which will show us each one of these, memorize these things. Aeolian, very less amplitude, millimeters to centimeters. Galloping in the range of meters with 
3 hertz on 3 hertz frequency and then we can use 10 hertz with amplitude in centimeters. I will see a video about that which show us the Eulian vibration and this is when you say when you have to feel the frequency what is meant by 100 or 150 hertz and they call it sometimes this type because it has the highest frequency like flutter the, the bird movement of the wings are rough for the highest let's say beats per second between birds is for the hummingbirds a third one man it can reach up to 80 beats per second it's only 80 beats per second for the hummingbird this can reach up to 150 hertz now see how the conductor move this is as we said amplitude is in the range of millimeter and centimeters but the vibration is very high this happens when there is steady slow speed wind in normal condition hitting the conductor of the transmission line by the way is the picture clear the video clear or there is continuous any problem with seeing the video okay we said this is happened because of the steady slow speed wind for the conductor facing this wind some of the wind will pass above the conductor some be the conductor the forces are not symmetrical are not balanced so they will vibrate the, the conductor will be vibrated between two this like this case This is the Aeolian vibration. This can you know, make fatigue to the strands of the conductor, as you can see. The strands of the conductor will break under this continuous vibration of the conductor. And uh, in order to resolve this, there are many ways. One of them is to reduce the tension. When you reduce the tension, the vibration will be less. Imagine that you are holding a rubber between your hands. When you stretch it and hit it, it will vibrate, make it relaxed. You will reduce the vibration. But with this solution, the sag will increase. You can see the sag. And the clearance above the ground level will be less this also has to be taken into consideration for transmission line depending on the voltage there are minimum ground clearance distance between the conductor and so if you are going to do this we have to take this into consideration this is one way of resolving the island vibration second method is to use special type of conductors can you we have, as we saw in the previous lectures, we have AAAC, all aluminum alloy conductor. It's all aluminum, but aluminum is soft, cannot withstand, withstand forces. So normally you will find the ACSR, aluminum conductor, still reinforced to give it the tensile strength. Changing the shape also of the conductor will reduce the iron vibration. Also, it's at a price. And for the aluminium, your aluminium one, you can deliver more power on this conductor if you compare it to the other one with the steel reinforcement. Always we need to have compromise between this and this. Third method is to use dampers or clamps. And in order to understand how do clamps or dampers reduce this effect on transmission line. Uh, Nikola Tesla said one day, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you have to think about it as energy, frequency, and vibration. Understanding the three, these three things will help you a lot 
in understanding the physics of engineering. This vibration of the conductor is an energy. Energy is traveling through the conductor. So when you provide something that can dissipate this energy by movement, by heat absorption, by anything like this, you are reducing the effect of this energy on your conductor. And normally this is, it is clamped near the connection point of the conductor, near the fixing point, near the, or close to the isolator. Second type is what we call galloping. This is, this is the most severe. This amplitude can be in the range of meters. And the word gallop is taken from normally mostly used with horses. There is one way for the horse to walk is to have all the four legs off the ground. This is the galloping. This is the most used field for the word galloping. And it's exactly this is what's happening to the transmission line. They are like dancing. Similar movement, that's why they call it galloping. Here you can see one example of 400 kilovolt galloping of the transmission line. It's very dangerous. It's, it has severe effect. And normally when this happens, people should be away from the transmission line. And you will see that there's car living on the street. Immediately when you saw this, you will pull over in order not to be close to the area. This is very dangerous movement. Galloping is like dancing over transmission lines. This is another example for the 33 kilovolt. Even for lower voltage, it's there. Now, galloping is normally happening only where the area is facing uh, snow. When the snow or the ice is accumulated in the conductor, it will act like an airfoil, if you remember the airfoil. The design of the airfoil, it's like this. When the air stream hits it, the underneath the flow of the air will be lower speed. So it has more forces opposite to the one above the airfoil. So this will give it a lift to speed. Also, there is a drag. This is, you remember we explained this. It, it's the design of the wing of the airplane, aircraft. It's available in the solids moving in fluids. If the conductor of transmission line having an ice on it, the cross section will be no more circular. It will act like this one. So this will create, the aerodynamics will create very strong movement of the conductor. It can take range of meters as you saw the video. We can reduce galloping by some accessories used in between on the transmission line, or we can make it, make the tension more. Remember, everything has a cost. If you look at the videos and imagine that you make the tension more, it's clear that the vibration, the amplitude of vibration will be less. Third one is wake induced oscillation. The word wake means the trace which is left by a solid moving in fluid. Same as the one you see with the aircraft or the ship. The, this is trace which is left behind the aircraft or the ship, both of them are moving in a fluid. This is equal it weak. For iron and galloping, it happens for both single conductors and bundle conductors. This one is only for bundle conductors. This phenomenon of 
wake induced motion is only on bundle conductors. And here is an example video for you can see so many bundle conductors. But remember that we said it's in the range of centimeters. Here you can see maybe the galloping more than the, the, the other one because galloping is superseding by its higher amplitude. But here it's very clear that all the conductors are bundled. This conductor is in both wake induced and globing motion. How this wake induced is happening? When you have bundled conductors, for simplicity, let's take two conductors in the bundle, only two conductors. So when you have wind, one of the conductor will be in the upstream side, the other will be in the downstream side. So we call this upstream conductor and that one downstream conductor. The upstream conductor will be moved by the air and it will create a wake in between. This wave will take the downstream conductor in and forth, moving inwards and outwards from the wake. This is in the range of centimeter. Uh, frequency is in the range of 10 hertz. This style of induced motion, induced oscillation, can be resolved by three ways. One of them is to twist the bundle conductor. Remember that we are talking about energy, vibration. You have to understand why do we do this. We saw that this energy is between the two conductors. We want to make it make something that will reduce this based on the wind direction. So twisting the conductor is one issue. Other thing is more the, the spacer will be longer. Normally those bundle conductors they have spacers. If we make the spacer longer, of course the weight will, we will have less effect. Third method is to use spacer at different spans. This will balance or, or unbalance the vibration of the two bundle conductors. By proper design, making different span lengths will reduce the weight induced solution significantly. How do we prevent vibration? One of these items is the use of armor rod. Armor rod is a bunch of arm wires and uh, these are steel, very strong, but the color of course they are galvanized. They will be clamped to the conductor near the tension point. It, they will absorb the energy from the vibration and also will protect the strands of the conductor. We saw that these strands at this high tension point they are exposed to fatigue and they will break. This will help of enforcing them and preventing the break of the size of the conductor. Another type is the stock bridge dampers. These have so many designs, like this one or this one. By this, we completed the chapter four. We will start now a new chapter for system stability. Before this, if there's any question, anything not clear, Please let me know before we start the new subject. What do you mean by the last one, the stock bridge one? The stock bridge damper? Both of them, both of them are used to reduce the vibration of transmission line. There are so many accessories used for reducing the these are the most two common things, armor rod and the stock bridge damper. You saw the design, it's designed to like to, we said we have to make balance between energy and vibration. Like when you have a wave, vibration, oscillation, there is energy transmitted with this wave. If you leave it, it will destroy your conductor. Providing this damper, which you are asking about it, will convert this energy to motion of the two, you saw the two sides of the damper, or to heat or something else, it will take the energy from this wave outside the conductor. Any other question before we move to the new chapter? Okay, now we have a very important subject in electrical engineering about system stability. 
It's of high, it's simple, but it's of high importance. When we talk about stability of our system, we are talking about the stability of the synchronous generator. If you recall, when we are studying the power plants, we have turbine connected to the generator. This turbine is rotating at high speed, maybe 1,500, 3,000, 300. 1600 revolution per minute. This will be given as a mechanical energy to the synchronous generator. Why do we call it synchronous generator? What is meant by synchronous generator? What's the difference between synchronous generator and asynchronous? Always to that one. We need to understand what is meant by synchronous generator, but we'll only hit the basics that we need to understand the power system stability. We don't want to go deep in that. The main things that we will mention in the explanation of the process of stability will shed some light on them. So any machine has two parts, a stator and rotor. As you can see here in the figure, we have the stator, the stationary part, and there is a rotor. This rotor has two poles. These poles are created by a coil around the rotor and fed by DC current. That's what we call excitation. Excitation generators and simple generators is supplying DC current to the coil on the rotor to provide the magnetic field. And it's by other means, it's to create a magnet. This is an electromagnet. So, if we rotate this magnet, and this, in some small machines, maybe this will be permanent magnet, like this. That one is electromagnet, this one is permanent magnet. Small machines, it's not feasible for hardcore machines, but for small machines, you can find this one. And the issue is to create a rotating magnetic field. When we supply this by the excitation, by the DC current fit to the coil on the rotor and rotate it at a speed. This will, by induction, create a voltage at the stator terminal. This voltage at the stator terminal has a frequency. This frequency is related to the mechanical speed of the rotor by the relation of course, they are the same. They have to be the same. But normally, for frequency electrical system, we use cycle per second. For mechanical one, for mechanical speed, we use revolution per minute. So, are the same differs only by the number of pole pairs. If, like this case, I have two pole pairs, two poles, sorry, I mean one pole pair, means that. If the your system frequency is 50, the rotor speed is 60 by 50, 3000 revolution per minute. It's the same as the electrical frequency. It's only converging between second and minute. So, since this is speed, the mechanical speed of the rotating manual is the same as the system frequency, the voltage of the source, we call it synchronous speed. They are the same speed. If there is a slip in, in this speed between the two speeds, very little slip, it will be no longer considered as a synchronous machine. It will be called asynchronous or induction machine. That one which has slip, different speed between the rotor rotating magnetic the rotor and the state of frequency, these are induction machines or asynchronous machines. But for generation of electricity, our Generator is synchronous. Remember this synchronous means the mechanical speed of the rotor or the magnetic field is the same as the speed of the stator wave, which is the voltage generator the stator terminal. Now this generator will be supplying a load through a transmission line, a cable, a conductor, which has both resistance and inductance. If I can keep balance between that load side, the output power, and the generation side, the input power, then the system will be said is stable. The system is in equilibrium. 
the historical system always is changing. The load is mostly changing, increasing or decreasing. The attenuated side, the control system, or the power system has to monitor this and control the balance between the two. If some disturbance happens, the system shall regain again a stability condition. So suppose that something happened to the system, the load side or the neutral side, if the system regains the state of stability, it will be a stable system. If it doesn't, it will be out of synchronous. This synchronous generator for any grid will be connected to what we call infinite bus. We'll come to the meaning of infinite bus. But first, if this generator which is connected to the infinite bus is in synchronous, is stable, is in a stable bus, we call the power system is stable at that side. And normally, being connected to an infinite bus will force it to be stable. How? We have to understand what is meant by infinite bus. And in order to understand what is meant by infinite bus, the best thing is to understand what is not an infinite bus. This will clear the image of infinite bus for you. You remember this figure, this is the experiment you've done in the lab when you connected different loads to the generator. And you notice that whenever you increase the load, the voltage will be decreased less and less. Why? Because, as if you recall, there was internal impedance for the generator. This internal impedance, which is here by R and X, resistance and reactance, will have current flowing through them and there will be voltage drop across them. Go up with the load, the higher the load, current, the higher the voltage drop in this. And it's clear from the graph. This is the same graph that you've done in the lab. So this is not an infinite bus. This is a single generator running separately. But what we have in our power system is so many generators are connected to the bus. Now, for this variation of the voltage in the previous example, the factor affecting the voltage drop is the internal convenience of the generator. Now, if you are connecting these generators to the bus on generator 1 up to generator n, as if you are putting these internal impedances in parallel. Remember that if you connect resistances in parallel, the equivalent, the total equivalent of them will be lower than the less than the lowest one of them. So the internal resistance of this generator collection connected to the bus will be very less. It is considered as zero, zero internal impedance. We can now understand what is infinite bus. It has zero internal impedance. Change the load, the voltage will not change. It's connected to a system which is forcing it to be stable, giving constant voltage. You saw in the sequence generator, we have two things. We have the voltage and frequency. This is, will resolve the voltage issue. But what about the frequency? The frequency is related to the speed. It can be understood that whenever you have a rotating machine at a high speed, when you load it suddenly, the speed will be reduced. The opposite thing, if the machine is running, this machine is running at a certain speed, load connected to it, remove the load suddenly, the speed will go up. Here, I made a little video for you. This is diesel generator I tested. I'll make the video slow motion so that you will notice that when you connect the load, the speed which is supposed to be 1,500 RPM revolution per minute. This is a generator. The alternator width has four poles. So the number of poles here is two, which will lead to 1,500 revolution per minute. Now we'll see when we connect the load how the speed will be dropped. This is very fast because this generator has a Normally, modern diesel generators will have electronic governor very fast. But I make the, the video slow for you. You will see how the speed will go down. It will come back 
to the speed again by the action of the governor. If we don't have this governor, the speed will be kept at its lowest figure. Next to it, when we remove the road, you will see that the speed will go up. Now, it was easy to explain how the voltage of the infinite bus will be kept at a constant by this zero kernel impedance of the infinite bus. For the, the frequency, it needs more explanation. In order to make the idea clear, we'll take a mechanical example. We want to understand how if the suddenly one of the generator that goes faster or slower how the system will adjust its speed to normal it's a bit tricky let's take this mechanical example these cars suppose they are speeding in a circular drive at the same speed all of them and they are connected by a rubber band each car is like a rotor rubber band is like transmission line as long as they have the same speed, nothing will happen to the rubber band. They are moving side by side at the same speed. But suppose that one of the cars suddenly has been given some push to go faster. Focus on the mechanism. This car is giving the speed faster to go faster than the other cars. As soon as it's moved faster, it will pull the two cars connected to it. So it's like with this fast speed, it will be given more load to take. More load to take will give, and this will give to the other cars, it's like chain. The other cars will be a bit faster, and this car will be pulled back because it's, it took another load. This will continue, this chain will continue till the system is stabilized. Again, to explain it again, this car which was given sudden speed to go faster than the other cars, as soon as it goes faster, it will take the cars connecting to it faster. But they are loading this car, so they will reduce the speed, it will be pulled back, this will continue for all the times till the system is balanced again. This is related to, to the moment of inertia. So there we said zero the resistance, but for the rotation we say infinite moment of inertia. Rotors of these generators, like this, these cars, are rotating as, at the speed, constant speed, if something some of them were subjected to some disturbance, this bulk inertia of the system will absorb it easily. The system <coughs> will go faster, it will be given more load to reduce it, to pull it back, which one which is going slower, there will, uh, some load will be relieved, so it will go faster. This will continue very fast, very, very fast, to keep the stability. This is if the this sudden disturbance is within an you know, acceptable range. If the sudden change was so high that the system cannot handle it, this car which has given this cannot handle it, the rubber band will break. We call it's now running out of the mechanism, out of the step. It will be thrown out from the system. The system will disconnect it because it cannot maintain the stability. So we want to define stability. What is meant by stability? Stability is condition of equilibrium between opposing forces. You have opposing forces, you have to keep balance between them. If something happened, balance between, here we say the input and output side, generation and consumption side. If something happened in one of the side, system will be unstable, 
it has to regain stability again. These opposing forces keep a track of the system that whenever there is disturbance, it will regain stability again. It will push it again to the stable condition. This is also a mechanical example, which will show what we mean by stability. This small ball is inside a deep ball, and if we give it a push, it will oscillate and and forth till it will come to a stable condition. There are forces which retain the ball to its initial position. In this case, it's the gravity force. So here we can say the system is stable. Even the ball was disturbed, but the forces in the system, here is the gravity, pull the ball back to its initial position. Again, stability maintained. On the other hand, if you put this ball in a hill shape, hill -like, and put it in either side, you will never have a stable ball again. So this is unstable equilibrium. Now, let's study the steady state stability. After that, after deriving the mathematical form, we can give more sight to the physical meaning of the stability of force. Suppose that we have two machines. One of them is generator, the other is motor. One of them is generating power, one of them is consuming power. Between them, the transmission line. This line has impedance, which is Z. Consists of resistance, series resistance R, and reactance X. And there's a current flowing from the generator side to the motor side, to the left side. Let's first draw the phasor diagram of the system. Let's EM, the voltage of the motor, as the reference. All the parameters, EG, EM, I, Z, all of them are vector quantities. They have both magnitude and angle. So if we take EM as a reference, means that we consider the angle of this voltage at the receiving end, at the motor side, as the reference. Of course, this can be done for the generator as well. For phasor diagram, whenever you take the reference, this doesn't mean that this reference has to be fixed. You can choose any reference. The only thing that will happen that is if you are rotating this phasor diagram. So if we put it as a reference, there is a current flowing in the motor. This current I has an angle phi 2 lagging EM for any for any motor on the board. There will be angle for the current lagging the board. Let's assume that this is phi 2. Now we want to go backwards to see the resultant EG, the voltage at the generation end. Now in between between the generator and motor we have impedance Z consisting of R and X for the resistance it will be in phase with the current so we can multiply i by the resistance to get the voltage drop back so also resistance only and you remember from phasor diagram we we'll put it tail to head because we are going to have to see the resultant voltage at the sending end so this voltage drop across the resistance is in phase with the current we take it put it tail to head with the EM, which we took as reference. For it across the reactance X, we will multiply the current by the reactance I times X, but it will be, it will be having 90 degrees to that of IR. And J always means that there's 90 degrees between the two components. So this is I multiplied by X. Now what I did here, I put all the voltage before the generators, head to tail, then I easily find the result in EG, the voltage at the generator side. This one will create an angle delta between this voltage and the reference voltage. This angle delta is equal to the power angle. Sometimes we get power angle Auto angle, good angle, torque angle, all the same. It's the most determinant factor for stability system. This angle delta. How? We will see now. Now, for the power delivered to the motor, to the load side, 
<coughs> always the power is voltage multiplied by current by the power factor, cosine the angle between them. So the voltage is Em, current is I, and we saw that the angle is phi 2. So the power delivered at the motor side is Em I multiplied by cosine phi 2. We want to find I. We want to derive expression for the current I. This current I is between two voltages, between Eg and Em. Subtract them from each other, divide them by the impedance Z of the transmission line, you will get that current. But remember that this is all of these I, Eg, Em, Z, all of them are vector quantities. Here in menu, see them in bold. Sometimes we put an arrow above each one to distinguish it between the vector and the quantity. And also we can put it to normal lines to show the quantity. But it is the vector quantities. Eg minus Em divided by Z. If you want to find current in a simple electric circuit, you see the voltage drop between the two points and divide divide it on the impedance you get the current. Now substitute for each one of these its magnitude and angle. We saw that EG equal EG with angle delta. EM has zero angle. Z let's consider that the angle between R and Z phi Z. So this formula for the current will be EG angle delta minus EM angle zero divided by the magnitude of Z the angle is theta Z. This can be simplified by dividing each term up on the Z. So you have EG divided by the magnitude of Z and for angles divide them, subtract them to be delta minus phi Z. Other part will be EM divided by the magnitude of z, and the angle is minus phi z. We have zero up minus phi z minus phi z. This is the simplification of the formula for i, but we will only this simple expression of eg minus n divided by z, we put for each one of them the magnitude and angle. Now, for any quantity which has real part and imaginary part. You know this. You can say that real part is equal to the real part of the other side, imaginary part equal to the imaginary part. So when for the I, remember I of any, any vector quantity will be I cosine phi plus J sine phi. So the real part is I cosine phi two. I take only the real part of the right hand side, which will be cosine the angle. I'm here making an equality between the real part and the real part. Before we see here, before we saw, <coughs> we saw that these are still vector quantities. If I want to solve this, I will say I equal I cosine phi plus J sine phi, and for the right hand side will be eg over the magnitude of z cosine delta minus phi z plus j eg over z sine. This simple thing, the only thing that we've done is take the real part equal to the real part. Now we have eg over the magnitude of z cosine delta minus phi z. Phi z is the angle of the impedance of transmission line, minus each EM over the magnitude of Z multiplied by cosine minus phi Z. Now phi Z for the impedance of transmission line, it's easy to see that it's get to this triangle. So for the value of Cosine, of course, cosine minus phi z equal cosine phi z. Cosine minus x equal cosine x. So I want cosine phi z. If I look at this triangle, 
cosine is r over z. r over z is the cosine. I can take this and put it instead of cosine minus five z. So I'll be having r over z. Why well, I have already z there, it will be r over z squared, the magnitude of z squared. This is i cosine phi 2. We remember that we started to find the power delivered at the load site. It was em i cosine phi 2. I already have i cosine phi 2. If I multiply it by em, I will be getting the power pm. So the same equation will be multiplied by em. We will be getting this equation. The power delivered at the motor side equal eg em over z cosine delta minus phi z minus em squared r divided by the magnitude of z squared. Now, if we consider the, the resistance, the series resistance of the transmission line is negligible, is zero. So the second term on the right hand side can be cancelled. If now, if R0, how much is phi z? Who can tell me how much is phi z? If R0, how much is phi z? Who can tell me? Nobody? I'm talking about the angle between R and X, the impedance of the transmission line. We assume that the resistance is zero, negligible, so we, are, we cancel the second part on the right hand side. If R zero, how much is phi Z? Who can tell me? Are you following with me or nobody is there? My question is that if the resistance, series resistance R is considered zero. How much is phi z? This is the triangle which relates z R x. Now, to simplify my equation, I consider that R equals zero. I cancel part of the equation. If R equals zero, how much is phi z? Who can tell me how much is phi z? Waiting for your answer. Ms. Aisha Tarek asking to, to repeat the question. My question is that we reach this formula and to simplify it, I consider the resistance of the transmission line is zero. Based on this, this term will be cancelled. Phi Z is also related to R. 
if r equals zero, how much is phi z? This is the question. How? How zero? This is the triangle. This is the one relating R, X, and Z. If in this triangle, phi Z is equal, uh, sorry, if R equals zero, how much is phi Z? Miss Shock, yes, 90 degrees. 90 degrees. So if phi z is 90 degrees, cosine delta minus 90 degrees equals what? If for only this term, this part, if phi z is 90 degrees from mathematical cosine and sine equations, cosine delta minus 90 degrees. No, what zero? We said that phi z is 90 degrees. Ms. Shok Al Jabari answered this. The next question if this phi z is 90 degrees, cosine delta minus 90 equals how much? We can see. If phi z is 90 degrees, cosine delta minus 90 degrees, how much? Ms. Asha Tarek, you cannot give number. This you have delta, you have variable. It will not never be a number cosine delta minus 90 degrees. It will be sine delta. Cosine delta minus phi z minus 90 equals sine delta. So this is the equation. This is the simple equation for power delivered at the load side. Simply sending in voltage EG multiplied by receiving voltage EM divided by the impedance of transmission line, multiplied by sine delta. And remember that we said R is equal zero. So the Z will be only X. It will be reduced to P generated, same as P delivered to the load, equal EG multiplied by M divided by X sine delta. And this is the most important equation for power system stability and this angle delta we should it's sometimes we call it power angle sometimes rotor angle load angle torque angle is the determining factor for the power system stability let's see how this equation as you can see it's sine wave we can draw it and we can see that if delta is 90 degrees the maximum delivered power which will be equal to maximum generated power is eg em over x the two voltage at the sending and receiving and multiplied by each other divided by the impedance of tangent line it was being reduced to only the reactors x very simple this is the minimum power can that can be delivered now for the system to be stable as we said it has to regain stability if it was subjected to a disturbance. We call it stable, instable with the bus, instable with anything. If under some conditions, and under some disturbances, the system will regain stability again. These disturbances can be divided into two categories. One of them is small disturbance and large disturbance. For the small one, we can notice it always because always the load is changing. Whenever you change the load, 
you have to control the generated power at the other side by increasing or decreasing. This is a small disturbance which can easily control the throw the governor, as we will see, of the prime mover driving the generator. This prime mover can be controlled to maintain the to increase or decrease the power to maintain the stability. But sometimes there will be large disturbance like short circuit. Like if you lose a large generator in the system, remember that you have infinite bus. This large generator hooked to this bus is highly making the system stable by the very small resistance, internal resistance, or by the inertia, very high inertia of this large generator. If you lose it, then will be hit. Remember the example of the cars. We said that each car like a rotor and the rubber band connecting them like a transmission line. So if the system can, after some months, regain this stability again, we can call it its in synchronism or stable condition. If it cannot, like the other example, when we say that the pushing force for the car exceeds the capability of the system, it will run out of the system, it will be out of synchronism, it will be unstable. Based on the, this mechanical system for the cars, let's see physically what is happening to our electrical system. How? How, if some generators start to accelerate or decelerate, how they will be provide restoring force like the car example that will pull these generators back to their stable condition. Take this simple example for a power system. We have two generators G1 and G2 feeding a load and they are sharing the load and you can see here the portion that supplied of the load that supplied by the first generator and the other generator. This is in the stable, normal condition. What will happen? If this G1 goes faster, if, like, remember the car example, if it goes faster, means delta 1 will advance, means more power will be given to that generator, more power it will reduce its speed slowly. So this was solved by giving, you now see the sharing, see the difference in sharing between the first case and the second case. Now G1 took more part of the load to reduce this speed. This will bring it back to lower speed so the speed difference between this generator and the other generator will be reduced. System will regain stability again. Methods that will increase system stability. There are some methods that can be used to maintain system stability. One of them is generator excitation. You remember at the beginning, when we talk about synchronous generator, we said that the DC current, which is supplied to the rotor winding, is creating a magnetic field, converting this rotor to electromagnet. And this electromagnet will be rotated. The higher the current, IF, by, by the way, IF is the field current, because normally we call it the winding on the rotor is the field winding, and that, that one on the stator is the armature winding. IF is the field current, VF is the field voltage. It will be DC supply. DC means that the current will enter the winding of the rotor by the right hand rule. We can locate the north and the south pole of this electromagnet, which will be kept constant because it's DC. If it were AC, this will be be continuously changing 50 times per second. But here it's the, the, the poles of the rotor are 
fixed north and south. The only thing that we are rotating them to create this variable magnetic field, which we need. If you remember Faradelo, we need phi to be changing because the EMF electromagnetic force is related to d phi by dt change in the flux relative to the time. So here I can control the voltage whenever I increase the field current, I can get higher voltage with the opposite resistor at the state of terminal. This is the first method. Second method, see this the equation that we got if we keep the power at the generating in constant. In this case, we will increase the voltage at that state of terminal, but we will keep the generated power constant. So in this case, delta will, will have to be less to maintain this equilibrium in the equation. And keeping the generated power constant, increasing the voltage at the generator side, the sine delta, the power angle, the torque angle will be reduced. Third method is if we reduce the reactance of the network. Remember, on the tangent line, we said there are so many ways to reduce the reactance of the network. We studied them there with our bundling of the conductor. Another technique that we use there, if we reduce the reactance, Ix, this phasor diagram, will be lower than this new EG voltage at the state of the synchronous generator will be reduced. This will bring delta down. Delta is related to the stability. If I can keep it lower, I can control the stability of the system. If it hits higher value, we'll see this. we we'll see how higher values of delta will force the system to be run out of synchronism. We have to keep always delta low. With a compromise, we'll increase it to increase the power. It, it will control the amount of power delivered. But to a certain limit, we'll see it now curve. But by this technique, by this method, if I do this, if I reduce the reactors on the transmission line, I will bring this delta to a lower value. A method number four, I can use parallel transmission lines. This also, as you can conclude, will have the result of reducing the impedance of the transmission line, giving you the ability to transmit more power. The fifth method, and the last method, is sometimes it's used for very long or very high voltage transmission line, putting a capacitance between the conductor's transmission line. By mathematics, you can understand this, because this capacitance will, as if you are wiping part of the inductive reactance of the transmission line, by adding this capacitive reactance. And even by mathematics, that one plus J, this is minus J. So this will wipe out part of the reactance as if you are reducing the reactance of the underlying getting the same results. How the system stability is maintained? Suppose that you have a stable system and there is disturbance happening to the system. This system, which is now subjected to this disturbance, there are two possibilities. It was already stable. In this case, it could oscillate, vibrate, as we saw before, till it reached a new stable condition. The system controls will bring this back to the stable state. The system will regain stability again. If the system is unstable and subjected to this disturbance, then I could be positive damage to the unit. In this case, the system will shift out. The system will take the units which are out of the one by one in order not to affect the other system. We have to understand this when we are controlling the stability of our system. If it is stable and can be easily controlled and brought back to the stable condition, but if not stable, we have to take it. Suppose that, for example, there are very big load changes and suddenly there is short circuit. This disturbance and disturbance will lead to percussive failure of the system components. Or the other case, we maybe will major a uh, portion of the power system, major generator will be taken out. This is again 
exactly the same example of the two generator units that we took before, but here to understand the physics, what is happening in the power plant when some disturbance is there. Suppose that you have two generators, also suppose each of them is driven by a steam turbine. It can be gas, it can be diesel, it can be hydro, it can be, but for something common for you, you can remember easily, let's take the steam turbine. We remember that when we studied the schematic diagram of the steam turbine, there was governor which controls the steam flow of the high pressure turbine. Control the steam flow means control the speed of the turbine. Speed is related to power. So are you controlling the power, the mechanical power which will be fed to your generator? This governor, as you can see here, is like a valve. It will open or close based on the feedback of the control signal. So suppose that for this generator, the first one, delta 1 is in ahead, while delta 2 is behind. What will happen? These generators are connected to the rest of the grid. They are connected to an infinite bus. If this case is there, one of the generators has the delta 1 is in ahead, while delta 2 for the other generator is behind. Remember the equation. Delta 1 is in ahead means this generator will feed more power. Mathematical explanation, simply from the equation. Delta 1 sine delta 1 is more, so more power is there. If there is no governor on this steam turbine, the speed of the generator will go down. But normally when this happens, immediately this valve, this governor will open, as you can see the opening there, to give more steam, to give more power, to maintain the speed of the synchronous generator as it was before. Similarly, for the other one which is in behind, behind means delta 2 is less, if delta 2 is less from mathematical equation, means that the power is less. If you don't have, again, if you don't have this control valve, this governor, the steam turbine, you can imagine that the speed will go high for the generator. Power is less, you are reducing the output of this generator, so the speed will go high, you need to reduce it. So this valve, this governor will close to reduce the amount of steam fit the, the, the turbine to reduce the speed of this one. So in either case, this is similar to the mechanical car system as we said. Whenever there is something, there is a balance. There are this, these are, we call them, restoring forces that will restore the stability of the system again. Now, remember the sign curve that we draw, it has two parts, one for the generator and one for the motor. Let's take the one for the generator. And in this part, you can clearly see that for the first portion of the curve near to the zero, if you draw a straight line tangent to this curve, it will almost head it up to 40 or 50 degrees. After this, we call at this portion where you can put a straight line tangent to the scale, you, you, you call it steep. But if you go further, the curve will be a flat. This flattering will mean that stability is in danger because if delta is increasing, a small change increment of power will be there. And the, at the first portion, it's very linear. But after that, the flattering point, if the delta is increased, only a small part of the power will be changed. And worse, if you exceed the 90 degrees, the maximum value, completely the system will be out of stability. Why? Because in this case, the power will be at the opposite relation. Delta is increasing and power is decreasing. So, maximum point we can reach is 90 degrees. After that, the power will be subjected to different opposing equation which will destroy the system. When we talk about the stability limit, it's the limit, suppose that you are at angle 40 or 50. Between 40 or 50 and the 90 degrees, this is your limit to the stability. You can move 
increasing of the power up to this point. This is the stability limit. Stability limit between the point that we are working on and the 90 degrees point. This steep and flatter portion can be also explained by mechanical example. If you have a deep pole and you have this pole inside it, you can easily say that and disturbance will easily bring this bone to the initial stable condition. While if you have a flat, rich flat plate, this will, you cannot guarantee the stability. This flatness of the dish or the plate will maybe keep the pole vibrating or oscillating around the stability wall. Maybe it will run out of the plate, getting out of the prism again. As we explained earlier, you can see here for this curve, normally from experience of power system, and between 40 and 30 degrees, these are reasonable limits that you can work on for work on them in stable power system. Ice point is 90 degrees, and your limit is between this point, with 40, between 40 and 50, and the 90. This is your stability limit. You should not exceed this stability limit. This can be also applied on system, power systems. Two power systems connected to each other. Power system in Abu Dhabi and power system in Al Ain connected through transmission line. Not only generator to generator, system to system. The same equation, the same mathematical form. We are moving here now from system to system to understand one point which is important and it's added to the stability. We should not think only of stability. From this example, we have two systems, V1 and V2. V1 is the sending end voltage, V2 is the receiving end voltage. In the first case up, you can see we have short transmission line. In the second case, we have long transmission line. Both of them are governed by the same equation, which is P equal V1, V2 over X sine delta 1, two, delta 1, 2, means that delta between the two ends. Now, for the short line, X is small. Since X is small, it will allow you to transmit more power from mathematical, from the equation. And if you leave delta, one to to reach its limit, maximum limit, it might happen that this power will be more than the capability of the line. This is small x of this short line enables you to deliver more power. You can increase that as well to its maximum value with much, much more power and you will reach the, we call it the thermal limit of the transmission line. While in the longer transmission line, this is not happening. Since X is the transmission line is, line is long, X is high, so you can reach with delta 1 your maximum limit, making sure that you are not exceeding the thermal limit. In this, in this example, we are talking about more parameter controlling the stability is the thermal limit of the transmission line, current carrying capacity, load capacity of the transmission line. So, in this case, sometimes you will see similar curve. This curve will have on the x-axis the length of the transmission line. Here it's in miles, it can be in kilometers, and there there is term which is the power over PSIL, search impedance loading. Search impedance loading is a characteristic of the transmission line. It's like a mathematical form to have it. It's like V square multiplied by square root of C over L. It's characteristic of the transmission line taken as a reference. But from this, you can see that there is a thermal limit. So you select your link, the length of the transmission line, you go with a vertical line, you can see when you will reach this thermal limit. And the clear thing here is that we have to think about the 
not only the stability when we are controlling, by controlling the power flow, we are sending more or less current on the functional line. We are concerned about the stability of the functional line. We do care about that. Very important subject, but we have to keep in mind that we shall not exceed the current carrying capacity, the thermal limit of the transmission line. This is what meant by this one. This is all about the power system stability. Any question regarding power system stability? Do you have any question related to power system stability? Everything is clear? Does this mean it's, everything is clear? Did, did anybody record the lecture? Did anybody record the lecture? Nobody? Well, in fact, I forgot to record it because they asked me to record it. That's why I'm asking you if somebody recorded the lecture because I didn't. I forgot to do this. Recording in my site? I think this is automatic, right? All right, all right. I can't see stop recording. Yeah. Yeah. طالع لنا فوق انه في ايرور يعني يالس يتسجل. والله انا شايف شايف عندي ستوب انه بتسجل اوتوماتيك اتبعت بي اوتوماتيك خلاص كويس. في اي سؤال عندكم ولا يو ار اوكي وذ ذات؟ اني كويستشن؟ طيب بس كتذكير تنسوش بعث لكم ايميل بخصوص الامتحان حاولوا انه تدرسوا كويس فقط في الجزء اللي تكلمنا عنه الميك اب اكزام اي ونت يو تو جيت ماركس في هذا الامتحان في البروجكت لغايه الان اي دينت سي يعني اجين بقول لكم البروجكت من شان اعطيكم جايد لاين يساعدكم شيء يجي يعني زي ما بقولوا احنا بنفع اللي عليك عند الغاره في هذيك اللحظة ممكن يعني تاخذ درجات ما تكونش كاملة. I want you to get full marks on the project. This يعني this will help you to have guidelines how to formulate the structure of your project. We try to study well for the makeup exam. ما تنسوش إنه راح يكون برضه كمان الامتحان الثاني قريب. حاولوا إنه هالمادة تراجعوها أو أي سؤال ابعثوا لي على الإيميل أي استفسار. أنا جاهز. أوكي مس عايشة أي أي ويل دو ذات أي ويل أبلود إت. بالنسبة للسؤال البروجكت لسه البروجكت في معكم وقت بس أنا بطلب منكم تبعثوا لي ولو الدرافت الاولي حتى اعطيك ملاحظات تساعد في وضعه بالطريقه الصحيحه وللحصول على اكبر قدر من العلامات. اوكي اي ام دون اني وان دزنت هاف كوستشن هي كان لي شي كان لي الا اذا كان ثانك يو اول Submission is not, uh, يعني first we need to give you guidelines for the project. Still, we have time for the presentation.
إذا ما في عندكم سؤال لو كان لي شكرا لكم وإن شاء الله ربنا يعافيكم من الكورونا ومشاكلها يبعدكم عنها